everyone. Who taught today? Oh my gosh. Good job, guys. I can't believe you made it out. Wow. So give yourself, I'm really proud of you for all of that. <clears throat> you already took the first step. So this is our agenda for tonight. The, the workshop is an hour long. That's a lot, for, I mean, this is a lot for an hour. Um, it, so this is not gonna be a super deep dive, but I'm gonna go over a lot of strategies and we're gonna do some practice work that I feel like is definitely gonna help you. So you're gonna feel a little bit better tonight, hopefully sleep a little bit better. Okay. So one of the things that I like to do in my workshops is I like to have you just shout them out. Sometimes it takes a very bold first person to read the first one. And that person is? Tonight. Yes. Brave person number two. How to explore the why behind rules breaking behavior and why it is important. How to have a productive conversation with a child that's being mental. Mm -hmm. Four logical consequences are how to implement them. Lovely. Now, I like to start things off positive. So a lot of you are probably, probably most of you are here because you're having some challenges in your classroom. Congratulations, you are a New York City teacher. Um, you will always have challenges in your classroom and the fact that you're here and you're trying to work on them means that you're just gonna get, continue to get better and better. Um, so let, let's talk about what's going well first. I think this might be question number one. If you don't have a pen, I actually have two extras, but just take a minute and jot down what's going well. Maybe it's a routine. Maybe it's relationship building. Maybe it's one subject. Absolutely. Anybody else do, feeling good about their rules and expectations in their class? OK. That's good. That's, if you don't have that, you don't have anything, basically. <clears throat> OK, so now this is why we're here, right? So this is what, <laughs> what snaps your eyes open in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's like the one or two students. Um, who we love the most. Um, sometimes it's uh, one particular subject that's troubling. Sometimes it's a routine. Like if you teach elementary school, I mean, I had to do lunch and it was like every day a panic attack. Um, so right, let's jot that down. Just something that when you think about the first thing that really, really stresses you out, what is it? So let's keep those, we're gonna keep all of those things in mind when we're talking tonight. So this section is the 95%. And what I mean by that is basically, <clears throat> if you do this section right, which is your rules, um, your expectations, how you manage the rest of the classroom, this is gonna eliminate 95% of your behavioral problems or 95% of your issues, in other words. And I'll go more into that in a second. Okay, so here's, <laughs> here are the four pillars the first one is to remain calm and neutral. This seems so obvious, but raise your hand if you remain calm and neutral all day. I mean, let's be real. Of course you try, right? So why, why do you think this is so important when you're dealing with misbehavior? So, Right, it's important for you to stay in control for yourself, but also for the kids to see that the person in charge is in control, right? Has anybody ever been, do you ever remember um, being in a classroom where your teacher like lost it? Do you remember, what did it feel like? It's stressful, scary thing. It's stressful, it's scary, right? You don't, you're, you're scared for yourself, you're scared for the other students. If you're not scared, you're annoyed, you don't feel safe. Right? You're just thinking about them. You're not thinking about the material. So it's important. Do your yoga breathing. I have one of my closest friends. She meditates for four minutes every morning, I swear, and it helps. Try to remain as calm and neutral as possible. Fake it. This is huge. Um, our friend um, with the red sweatshirt, you were talking about this in the beginning, rules and um, communicating them. If your kids don't know what's expected of them, you cannot give them consequences. Right? Does that make sense? And especially if you teach lower grades, I've seen this a lot, I've done it a lot. 
your kids are talking in the hallway or they're talking during reading time and like you punish them and they, nobody, nobody gets to go to recess. Did you, are the expectations clear that you're supposed to be quiet in the hallway, right? And are you consistent with that? <clears throat> That's just an example. But before you give any consequences, make sure that your kids know what's expected of them and it's been drilled into their heads time and time again. This is what we're gonna talk about in, the next, in this next slide. And if you've done one of um, my workshops before, I, I saw a few familiar faces. This next section is gonna be familiar to you. But you wanna use the least invasive method possible. Does anybody think they know or know what that means? Did you, did you hear that? Can you say it louder? Don't give consequences right away. Don't like react and give consequences right away. So invasive is like when you're in, you know, in somebody's personal space, when you're getting, basically you want to not draw attention to the misbehavior or to the consequence. And we're gonna talk a lot about that. These two things will change your life if they're done well. We're also going to talk about that. Has anyone ever used interactive modeling? Okay. All right, if you haven't, I'm about to change your world, my friends. And it's not just for, it's not just for elementary school. Sorry, do you want me to go back? By the way, these materials are, are gonna be online. I should have said that in the beginning. Sorry. One moment, please. Okay. Okay. This is in your packet. Let's just take three minutes and just read. It's, it's on the first page of your packet. Look over the diagram and just read the explanations uh, of terms that go with the diagram. And let's take three minutes to do that. Has anybody used any of these strategies before? Okay, so before we move on, I just wanna make sure, so this section um, of the present of the workshop is on all these strategies but after this section the next two sections are on what happens when all that doesn't work so if you're looking at if you're looking at this and you're like okay that'll work for a lot of my kids but it's not gonna work for blah 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 then fine good because that we're gonna talk about those kids in a second um, who has tried some of these strategies raise your hands again okay Good. Are there any questions? Are you confused? Are you feeling like you understand the diagram? Okay. So basically, this is if the more students are breaking the, that are breaking the rule, the more you want to use less invasive strategies like this that refer to the entire group. These are also um, referring to the reason that they, this is a, these are large groups of people and it's non-invasive is because this is assuming the kids don't know what they're supposed to be doing. If 50 or 60% of your kids are not following the rule, they don't know what the expectations are, right? For the most part. Or at least they haven't been made, it hasn't been made clear that you expect that, right? So whole group uh, interactive modeling. This is what interactive modeling is, for those of you who don't know. It's really simple. I know it's in the packet, but it's something like this. So the uh, kids lining up, right? So you tell all the kids to line up. They're running, they're touching each other, they're doing what kids do, right? This is interactive modeling. You say, um, let me show you how to line up, okay? You get everybody's attention, they're, they're sitting down. Watch me. What do you notice? And you ask the kids, and three of them, they'll say, you were walking, or you were safe, or you weren't talking. Good. Who wants to try it? Go ahead, you know, to, to one student. Then one student's like, hey, I can do this. Then they walk, and then another kid does it. Let's try it all together. That's interactive modeling. And it seems like it's more geared toward elementary school, but it's really the tone and the way that you present it. If you're teaching high school and you're noticing that the kids are staying there sharpening their pencils for 15 minutes, you're like, let me show you how to sharpen a pencil. Watch. <laughs> Look, it's sharp. Who wants to try it? You know, like it doesn't, you can still do it with high school. So. I would strongly recommend that you try interactive modeling because it works. Kids don't remember what you say, they remember by doing, right? So if you're having the whole class try something, they feel success from doing it, they're much more likely to do it again next time. Reinforcing language is just positive narration. 
and I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. It's just stating what you want to see and what the positive things that you're seeing instead of the negative things. So instead of saying, great, good job, most of you are running when I just told you to stop running, right? Instead of saying that, you're saying, most of you are walking, let's try it again. Everyone should be walking. So you see that just the change in language, you're saying something positive instead of something negative. This is for large groups. So when you start to get in, this is like 50, 60, 70 and above percent of the class isn't following directions. This is when it starts to get into like a couple kids, right? When you just, do, <laughs> you're just do this. You're like, if you don't put that phone away, but you don't say it, but you just stand there and just wait. <laughs> Proximity. This is when you say, um, you know, there's a couple kids talking. If you're talking, please stop. Thank you. You know, something like that. Uh, the look, I mean, do I, does that need explanation? Everybody's got one. Right? And if you don't, you will. Um, silent signal to the correct is just saying, like, you know, just that type of thing, right? You don't need to say anything. And then embedded in individual correction is when you have to say something. Um, Michael put that away, then you go right back to teaching so that you can forgive the kid, we're moving on, we're not making a big deal out of this, and you go right back to teaching. This is what we're going to talk about now. But before we do, um, let's do a quick exercise. So if you were here for the last one, we did something similar, but I changed the scenarios. Who wants to take one of these and read it? I'll come to you. And we're going to decide which strategy to use. OK, you want to read it out loud? OK. I know, right? Wouldn't that make you so mad? Like, oh, and you want to get into it. You want to be like, it's stupid. I was up until midnight preparing this, or whatever you say. That makes you look so dumb. <clears throat> Any ideas? This is actually my hardest one. I'm kind of annoyed that this is the first one. What'd you say? Yeah, you could do that. This might no. That's what I was gonna say. This is this might be a private conversation. Was anyone else thinking oh, the same what thing? Oh, you had the same situation. It's an ongoing thing. And it's it happens. So, but that is, I was going to say, this is probably an individual, this is probably a conversation, right? And do you want to have this conversation? When do you want to have this conversation? Yeah, you don't want it. A kid like that, you do not want to get into them in front of the rest of the kids. They're trying, they're trying it. They want it. They want it. <laughs> right? Well, you can, you can. I, I'm just, I mean, I would advise against it, but. Um, so with that child, I would have a private conversation with them, um, just because they're they're obviously being de defiant. They're trying to s search for argument. Go ahead. Good question. Yeah. Very very good question. So you don't after class is really not doable. I found. Um, during class, when the, when the other kids are focused, if you can get everybody, so like for that situation, what, what did the kids say? I'm not doing this, this is stupid. Okay, so you act like it didn't bother you, even though inside you're like, I am going, like you're putting your hands behind your back. So you act like it didn't bother you, you just look around and everyone, everyone's good, okay, nobody needs anything. And then, and then you go to them, come here, you know, like, or whatever it is. And then you just go into a corner with them really non-confrontational, as non-confrontational as possible, or lean into the desk, but make sure everybody else is okay first, because we forget about that, <laughs> right? You just want to get into it right away. Go ahead. Yeah. 
and then you lost everybody else. That's actually one of the one of the slides talks about that wait time, and we'll talk about that. You you you're on to me. Um, actually, someone else. Someone maybe right here. Let's do maybe one more. What time is it? You have a strict no cell phone policy that the students are well aware of. There's a sign posted on, in the room that reminds them just in case. While you're teaching and the students are at their desks, you notice the students slouching and appearing to be reading something on his cell phone. Any ideas? I was just going to say. Proximity. Proximity. Try it. Yeah. 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 That one, yeah, that one you can try. Even prox proximity or, yeah, some of this might, might work. Um, and if it doesn't, then you can go here. Let's try one more. You want to read it? Can you guys hear okay? The objective no, is posted along with an anchor chart to serve as a visual aid. Four minutes into work time, only seven are actually using punctuation out of, seven, out of 28. Did you guys hear that? So the lessons on punctuation during the lesson, only seven of the kids are use, actually using punctuation. That's like <laughs> written on the pages of my life, by the way. <laughs> yep. Did you hear that? So that's a, that's a great example of reinforcing language. Just a reminder, we're pu putting periods at the end of our sentences, you know. Um, or ju just a reminder, and you show them the chart, or make sure you're using a question mark, a period, or an exclamation point. Um, and then if that doesn't work, you can just keep going down the line. OK, you ready for the next section? This is when we get into the more difficult stuff. I want to make sure that we don't run out of time here. OK, this is the why behind that 5%. This is um, something that you just might want to jot down for yourself. Schools have different, I mean, the, I know the DOE has a pretty universal system, but schools have different policies with extreme behaviors. Um, with, you know, when it comes to restraining or uh, fighting, violence, things like that, you want to make sure that you know your school's policy. Um, if you're in a union, you probably already know. I taught at a charter school where there, I'm not kidding, there was no policy. So I had kids that were throwing blocks and fighting, and I was physically restraining them, and somebody to finally told me you're not supposed to do that. I was like, really? You can get fired for that, and nobody told me. So make sure that you research your, um, the school's policy, okay? All right, this isn't a little heart. So these are the different types of, <laughs> different types of behavior problems. There's lots of them. Defiance, probably everybody's least, is that your least favorite? Least. Yes. Oh, it just makes my blood boil. <laughs> but this is a good one too, though, right? Oh. <laughs> I know. Hey, if you is anyone teach elementary school? OK, so I used to have a three tattle rule at recess. Maybe a little controversial. Maybe, but it worked. Um, we went out for recess, and they had, were tattling all the time, and I was losing my mind. So I'm like, recess is supposed to be fun. Like, what? So I finally, beforehand, I said to them, you're allowed three tattles. That's it. And after three tattles, we're going to stop, we're going to have a meeting, and we're going to talk about why we're having so many problems. And they were like, so at the whole of recess, they would come up to me and be like, he, he, he. And I was like, is this worth one of your three tiles? They're like, no. And then they would go play. <laughs> so try it. It works. That was, I, when I discovered that, my life changed. Oh, yeah. the liars, the liars. This is, I mean, this is everybody, but. OK, so these are just some of your many behavior problems. <laughs> We forgot about the time waster, but the time waster can really mess things up too, right? For the kid that just sits there the whole time and does nothing. Yeah. OK. So I want you to think, this is in your packet. Think about a student, maybe something that happened today, maybe something that happened last week, who engaged in rule-breaking behavior. So something that, just, something that a kid did that 
really upset you or really upset the flow of the class. So what you want to do is first just write out what the child did, what you did, what the child did, just their behavior. It's, a, it's in your packet, I think, on the second or third or fourth page. And then in the second box, you want to state the ideal behavior. And I have examples here if you need them. Let's just take, let's see if we can do this in two minutes. It's more, it's helpful also if you think of a particular incident and not just what they're generally doing. If you think of like an incident, like he walked over to me, he asked me this, this is what I said back. Then he did this, then I did that. It'll help you to get behind the why. And then the, okay. So they walk out, okay, so they walk out of class during the lesson. The ideal behavior would obviously be that they stay in class or that they ask if they need to leave the classroom, right? Well, mine they stay. Because they really don't get the work. No, but so I'm saying the ideal behavior, like what you want them to do. Stay in the classroom, ask for help. Right. All right, one more. And that's a very, it sounds like a common one because a couple other people said. So, um, this is a <laughs> map that I created. <laughs> I showed Wayne this when I came in and he was like, oh my God. <laughs> I know this seems a little overwhelming, but I'll go over it with you. So um, this is a map of basically what you can do and how you can rethink the why behind your student's behavior, okay? So I'll give you an example, and then I want you to do it on your own. So, uh, or maybe two examples. So the first thing you want to think about is are the expectations clear, right? If the expectations aren't clear, then you need to make the expectations clear. None of this matters if the kid doesn't know what they're supposed to be doing, am I right? Are you with me on that? Okay. So my example is um, Kaim during writing every day, he's listening, right? I'm not teaching right now, but this is a kid that I had years ago. He's listening. He's actively listening. He seems like he's, he knows how to access the material. Everything is great. Um, it's time to go back to your seats and start writing. Sits there for 10 minutes and does absolutely nothing like this, right? That's a problematic behavior. So. Are the expectations clear? Yes. We've done it every single day, the expectations. They know what they're supposed to do. Is the problem a lack of skill or a lack of will? In this case, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. And sometimes you have to try each one. In this case, let's say it was a lack of will. So he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to write, okay? Are there consequences for the behavior is the next thing that you want to think about. Because sometimes that will, nothing gets a child more motivated than consequences, right? So in this case, no, there aren't any consequences. The consequence is that I'm going over to the student and being like, Kaim, you're a great writer. You know exactly what to write about. Remember on the rug when blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Remember when you told that great story? Oh, and you're such a great writer. Remember when we showed you? And it's like blah, blah, blah. He's getting exactly what he wants. He gets a whole teacher coming over to him and giving him a pep talk, right? So no, there's no consequences. And what he's getting is a reward. So what do I need to do is I need to have a consequence where it's like, you know what to write about before you leave the rug. Kaim, what are you going to write about? All right, go. And when nothing's on that paper in 10 minutes, it's when do you want to finish your writing? You got recess, you got, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's recess or science, you know. But now you have to have a consequence. And then you can go from there, right? So if it's what's trickier is when it's a lack of skill, right? I think it's trickier because will, I mean, it's, they usually respond to logical consequences. With skill, you don't always see it right away. Sometimes you don't know that that's the reason that the kid is um, not participating in class, not doing his work, trying to get kicked out. Do you ever have kids that try to get kicked out so they don't have to do the work? And a lot of times it's because they can't do the work and they're embarrassed. Um, so, does anyone have an example of a lack of skill they could share and then we could work through together? Okay. So, what do they do? How do what's the behavior that they Mm-hmm. 
Right. Uh, or the complete opposite, and they'll play so helpless that they need you to sit there the whole time. So you go, but I don't know anything. Mm hmm. And then you're there, you're spending all your time on like one or two students that may or may not actually know something. Yeah. Okay. So if this is a lack of skill, there's two different things that you can do. If it's a complicated skill, like fractions, then you have to break it down into simpler steps, right? But you have to say, like, today, you're just going to work on, God, oh my God, fractions. I can't even think of what's a simple skill in fractions. On um, halves and quarters. Yeah, common denominators, right? I said halves and quarters. You can tell I'm an elementary school teacher. Um, so today, we're just going to work on that so they can feel success doing that. They might even be able to do it independently. And then you can help the other kids, right? And then the next day, you work on a slightly more difficult or complicated skill. Um, but the, the point is that you have to break it down further. You're not going to go to consequences because they can't do the work. It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, if it's a simple skill, so like I had, um, I've had kids that were 12 to 1 to 1. And I'm, a, I'm a gen ed teacher, and I've had, um, you, know how the, you know how public schools are. You just, they're like, here's a 12 to 1 to 1 kid. And I'm like, oh, okay, but I don't teach SPED. And they're like, yeah, we know. Um, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm just checking. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I had this awesome, awesome kid who just, for whatever reason, hallway walking, not his thing, just like was not his thing. With the whole idea of walking in a straight line, he was like, woo! Like running up and down the line, high-fiving everyone. So, so I had to, that was the, that's a skill, right? I mean, it was like he really, and I know when kids are playing me, like he really just, he couldn't do it. Just the first half of the year, he couldn't do it. So I, that was a simple skill that I had to work on with him. And it was hold my hand at first. It was you got to hold my hand at first. And he didn't, he liked choices, so he was really defiant. So I would do sweaty hand or not sweaty hand. He was like, mm, not sweaty. But I gave him a choice. I was like, I gave you a choice. Like, what do you want from me? But that was the simple skill. And I had to teach him walking in the hallway. Look, we walk behind this row. We put one foot in front of the other. Our arms are at our sides. And he needed that scaffold, right? So sometimes it's complicated. Sometimes it's simple. You've got to get to whatever level they're at. You can't expect them to do something independently that they can't even do with a good deal of help, right? Make sense? Um, Okay, we kind of need to move. Do you, let's take two minutes and just look at your own situation and see if you can work, get some sense of this. So take your own um, problem that you're having with your student and see if you can come up with a solution. And let's just take one minute to do that. All right, moving on. So this is the one-to-one -one conversation. So we talked about all this, right? And now we're talking about this. And we talked about the why behind everything leading up to this. So now we're going to talk about what happens here. And this is where things can go absolutely horribly wrong. <laughs> as, I, as I've done many, many times. OK, if there's more than one student involved, don't try to talk. To, if there's more than one student involved, say they're having an argument or something happened and they're disagreeing, don't attempt to talk to them at the same time. Okay, just first wait till they calm down, like our friend said, but also um, don't attempt to talk to them at the same time. They're going to talk over each other. They're going to argue. It's going to make them more mad. Um, wait. See if they, you can actually give them paper and see if they can write out their version of what happened for a minute. And then you, can, you have a chance to look at it and see how ridiculous it sounds, too. But don't attempt to, to talk to both of them at the same time. Does anyone know what the lull is, or can they guess what it is? Yep, exactly. So has anybody, if you're wondering why it's so important to talk to a child when they're in the lull, have you ever, has anyone ever tried to make you feel better when you're really, really pissed? <laughs> it, do, do you want to share? It pisses you up. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you more mad. Like, think about when you, I mean, I can think of seven examples this week where I'm having, like, a grown woman hissy fit, you know, like my... I spilled coffee on my computer the other day. I was like, see, this always happens to me. Like, of course this happens to you know, and you're and if my partner had come over and he had said, like, yeah, I told you not to have coffee next to the computer, like, he would have lost his head, right? <laughs> or like, uh, you know, come over and tried to say, like, well, me honey, well, maybe next time you can 
or uh, well now it, the how much does that computer cost? So now this fifteen hundred dollars that you just like think about how you would feel if you just made a mistake that maybe you deserved, but someone's trying to talk to you and you're still really upset about it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Even if they deserve it, just wait. Wait for them to calm down. And honestly, if you, especially if you teach high school, actually no matter what grade you teach, sometimes that's the hardest part because the kids are really mad, <laughs> right? Who's had a really angry kid in their in their class before where you've almost felt unsafe? <laughs> yeah, right. You're like, you're like, yeah, no, just you. But it's hard unless they're throwing things or being violent. You gotta just just let them sit for a minute, okay? There's nothing you're gonna do to calm them down. So this is another thing. We talked about this a little bit before. Don't, um, it should be during your time. During, I'm sorry, during um, a time that's convenient for you. So when the kids are all settled, when they're all doing their work, um, or when you have some free time, you can talk to them. It doesn't need to be right away. This is also hard. I mean, if you like have a close friend or family member or a partner, I mean, this is the hardest part, is just listening to what they have to say, when the whole time you're just like, liar, liar, stupid, stupid. <laughs> just listen first, get all the information that you possibly can, and try to just be non-judgmental. Again, calm and neutral. There's a way of saying things, right? Like, there is a way of saying things. You can say, um, uh, and can you, uh, I'm trying to think of what you're saying. Why do you think you did that? I mean, that's like common neutral, right? Why do you think you did that? Or you could say, and why do you think you did that? <laughs> right? That's obviously not common neutral. The kid's like, <laughs> okay, this lady hates me. So it's your tone. And this is another huge one. Does anyone, like, want to elaborate on this? I feel like I've been talking a lot. I'm sorry. Describe the behavior, not the child. Do you know what I mean by that? Okay. Oh, Describing the behavior, not the child, is yes. Not, instead of saying, like, for example, the kid has no, they have no manners, saying he doesn't say please or thank you, right? Or he doesn't say excuse me. Or, like, it's, it, it feels disrespectful when you do that. You could even say that. It feels disrespectful. Yeah. I was going to say, would it be okay for to say, can you respect Yeah, no, I think so. Because you're not attacking their personal character. You know, you're not saying you're a disrespectful person. So I just read a statistic, and I'm going to get this wrong, but marriage, marriages are more likely to um, succeed when, they, when you validate each other's feelings. And like, it was like the number of times that they validated each other in, in a particular conversation, they were more likely to stay together versus getting a divorce when they validate. Do you know what validate means? OK, so like if I said, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, like, uh, I got caught throwing a pencil at somebody. Uh, he, cause, because he kept looking at me, and it was, it, like, do, do they always say that? Do they still say, like, every, I hate, I'm like, I'm looking at you right now. What do you, <laughs> like, um, because he kept, he kept looking at me, and I'm just so tired of it. I hate this school. What could you say to validate that kid when in your mind you're like, oh, my God. I understand why you feel that way, what else? Yeah, or like, mm -hmm. or that must have been frustrating. You just say that, like, that must have been frustrating yeah. when people are, I, yeah, when people look at you, that must have been frustrating. That's validating. Go ahead. Or even, uh, I understand that you don't like to look at you, but that's not the way we handle it. That's another great way, is just repeat, sort of repeating what they just said. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised at how much that can calm a child down, just validating. <coughs> okay. Hello. Okay. So these are just examples of, of um, how you can respond to, um, or how, how you can have one-to-one, one-on-one conversations with students. And you can just read this to yourself. A growth area is like, if this is a repeated problem, like if, a, if somebody keeps getting up and walking out of the room, or if there's somebody who's um, not reading during independent reading time, this is like a, rep a problem that keeps repeating. This is for something that just happened, and you're having a conversation about it. 
in your packet, it's like the pretty much the last page. There's this same the for incidents and then for growth areas. And then I have actually put a sample underneath in case you're wondering how to frame it all. And there's two scenarios. So you can choose one of those scenarios and then just write out the conversation that you would have with the student if that was your student. We actually don't have time for shares, sorry. But I'm going to go to the next slide. Maybe at the end. This is the last section, logical consequences. Want that to be logical. <laughs> Bingo. Okay, this isn't about payback, even though it. Fe <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, it is. <laughs> it feels that way sometimes, but it's not. You remember that what you want is for the behavior to stop. You're trying to promote positive behavior, right? Yes. <clears throat> It should be tied to the broken rule so that it's more likely to change the behavior. So I'll explain what that means. Who knows what logical consequences are already? What? Who, what logical consequences are? Do you know what they are? Raise your hand if you know what they are. Consequences Right. <laughs> it's funny. I said the same thing to my mom, and she's like, uh, I think I know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a term, but yeah, it's pretty uh, intuitive, I guess. Okay, so this is an example of something that's not a logical consequence. Someone, a kid is being rude, so you say, you can't go on the field trip, right? Have you ever done that? I would be like, you're, I guess you're not going on a field trip. I don't even know, like, I can't prevent you from going on that. I don't know why I'm saying that. It also has nothing to do with the child being rude, right? It's not connected to the offense. This is an example of an, a logical consequence. A kid is caught cheating on a test, right? So you tell them they have to sit by themselves the next time. Does that make sense, right? This is, it makes it much more powerful if you enlist their help. So if you say something to empower them, especially those kids that need power, you know those kids that I'm talking about, the defiant ones. If you say, like, how can we solve this problem? Do you have any ideas? What can we do? You break it, you fix it. That's a great one. So, like, uh, kids are messing around and um, they spill a bunch of materials. You're not cleaning that up. Right? You didn't do that. So they have to clean it up. And if, if they need your help cleaning it up, it's not going to be, it's going to be during like their fun time. You know, it's not going to be during their reading time. So if, in other words, whatever mistake they made, they need to make that right. You bring it, you fix it also applies to the apology, which by the way, is not just I'm sorry and then walking away. Do they, do they try that? Right? So if they say something and they make a kid upset, they think that they can just make it better sometimes by saying, I'm sorry. That's a great start, right? But the next question should always be, does anyone know? Yeah, I'm sorry because. Also, are you OK? I mean, they forgot to do that. But it actually makes a big difference. And sometimes the other kid will be like, no, <laughs> I'm actually not. And then they have to go, they have to figure out how to fix the problem. They're like, this, this, she's still mad at me, you know? But the point is just following it through until the end, until the problem is solved and always provide a choice. Even if it's not a choice, remember my example with, I almost said his name, I'm not supposed to say names, with sweat, my, which hand do you want, sweaty or not sweaty? That's not really a choice. Like we know that he's gonna pick the not sweaty one unless he's that, that weird. But like providing a choice with a defiant child, they, they just feel like they have some control in the situation and they're much more likely. Like going, this, that's an example of when you go back to that why, like what is motivating this child? Because that's, but I think that's, I think that's the key yes. to this, you know? And sometimes it's not just about the behavior. It's also like they're getting something out of this. They're getting something. What are they getting? Is it's it a test? And maybe that's what it is, you know? But I think that's the key. With those certain kids, those nuts that you can't crack, you have to figure out <laughs> what's motivating them. Why are they doing what they're doing? They're getting something out of it. You just don't know what it is yet, right? <laughs> Okay, I think this might be the last slide. These are just examples. 
of problem behaviors and common logical consequences. Sorry, I'll move. It's, sometimes it's hard to come up with logical consequences, so it's, it's a good idea to take a, a photo of these. We could just look at this. We don't have to read it, unless somebody feels like reading them. OK, any questions about any of these logical consequences or why they're logical consequences? <coughs> That's tough. That can be difficult mm -hmm. for us, particularly on the high, middle and high school level, where you're not with them all day. Yes. Definitely. So, this is more for elementary school, I would yeah. say. Yeah, I would definitely say that's more for elementary school. For high school, you're going to have to figure out a different solution, like homework, um, probably homework. Also, a lot of frameworks that are, like, they, they want you to come up with this concept because with the students. So it's like, what, what to do? And a lot of Okay, so or that's a. They have provided a consequence, but it's not logical, but they came up with it. Okay, love it. That's a really good question. I'm so glad you asked that. So I've had that happen before. When, when you're trying to enlist their help and coming up with a consequence, just write everything down and say, let's come up with some ideas and then we'll decide on one. And then the kid says something like outrageous. Like, I go to SeaWorld for a week. You're like, great, SeaWorld for a week. I don't know why I just said that. Um, you're like, maybe, you know, I think maybe you could do your work at recess. Let's write that down. Well, uh, maybe I won't have a field trip for two years. Okay, let's write that down. So then maybe, you know, you just write down everything and then at the end be like, hmm, uh, is there any that don't make any sense? Yeah, we're not going to SeaWorld. Let's cross that out. You know, and then, so then at least they feel like they got it, uh, their ideas out on paper. I found some success with that. Anything else? I know we're over time. If you, if they say that they, I've never had that happen. So like if you said um, you, like you haven't turned in your homework for, like if you like look at your, you could first of all look at a pretend paper and be like, um, I sh it shows that you haven't, you know, just pretend that you have something written down and be like, according to my documents. <laughs> And then, <laughs> like, you haven't turned in your homework for a week. They're not going to, would they really say, that's not a problem? I don't see why. I, would they? I have, I have a couple of like that in the same companies. They give trouble for a lot right. of class teachers that you don't know what to do with. But in particular, class, they give trouble for You might, okay, so if they're really, like, they don't understand basic things, like, you need to do your homework, are they they're really I saying that they don't? I expect them to, you know, it's not Yeah. I would talk to the parents, too, and make sure that you're communicating those important messages. I know that we're way out of time. Why don't we do questions? Here, why don't we do questions? And um, if you have to leave, you can totally leave. But if you have questions, then you can stay and ask questions. Um, we have another workshop tomorrow night on. Yes, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>